Now, you know, what's really funny is I, most of you people I've known, I've been coming here since 1993 with Ron Richards. Now, here's, here's what happens when you work 21 years at some place. I, was a, I, I have uh, multiple degrees, but my specialties don't go together at all. I actually am a specialist in uh, marine invertebrates, but I'm also a specialist in volcanoclastic structures and retired 15 years ago and decided I was bored and went back to school. And so now I'm a comparative anatomist specializing in primates, uh, humans, other things. I've recently last, I've always been a climate person, but I've gone a lot more into climate. And I'm working with uh, climate variation and how it affects different types of bird uh, behaviors and birds. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, birds and climate change. And I'm going to talk, I'm gonna, as I go through this, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, climate variation. And I don't really mean global warming at all. That has nothing to do with anything. It really doesn't. As a geologist, paleontologist, I've worked with climate over the last 500 million years. And it's been way hotter in the past and way colder in the past than any change that's going to happen, whether we cause it or not today. I'm not a person who's a catastrophist. I, I see it just as change, just as variation. And if I can find every, oh, and I do have, uh, I'll have some articles. And my wife and I did publish a chapter on a variation in the West African Rift Valley. I've worked eight years in Africa. My wife has worked all over the world as an MD, but she also was a medical officer for our camps and working in Africa. And she worked with me for four years doing studies on very Western Rift Valley change. And that's a, a Nova Press. That's a book that was published in 2011. I brought it. I just want you to see that we have done climate work other than with birds. I'm presently working at Glacier National Park. I love this weather, by the way. This is very, yeah, look, Amanda shakes her head. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, let's see. Hmm. It's warmer in Glacier right now than it is here, uh, but not by a lot. But last year in one of our areas that we have instrumentation set up, we had 108 foot of snow, and we had almost a month of 45 below zero. So every, everything is relative to what you think is true or not true and where you're working. I also worked on the equator in Africa. And anyway, this is birds, climate change, move, adapt, or die. And not all things are bad. I'm Randy Patrick. I'm from Marion University. I work through the Ecolab system there. I teach. Uh, a little bit, I'm retired. They give a list of things they want taught. I pick what I want to teach. I teach everything from epidemiology with calculus of emerging hemorrhagic fevers to freshman chemistry. If they, they never leave a class empty. And so I go in and play in the classroom. I just finished uh, three short courses on uh, deep time in Indiana, the last 500 million years. Now anyway, I want to talk about problems with doing the research. Here's the thing that they tend not to. Here is two pictures from where we worked in Africa. One, uh, the bottom one was taken in 1996. The top one was taken in 2008. They look really different because they are. And so when you're trying to see how things are affected by change, you need to, to understand what the change is. You need to understand the animal. And in many cases, subjects are picked for study that have too many variables. As a scientist, it really gets hard when you have lots of variables. This is kind of as close as I could figure out the area. This is true on it. Uh, there are many confounding problems. And that's why I take a lot of the things that are going on right now with very big grains of salt, very obvious grains of salt. And so in this area, we studied rainfall from, from 96 until 2000 and actually 2009. And what we noticed was that the rainfall really hadn't changed in the amount, but the start and finish dates had changed. And so what's happening, it looks like the savanna is going away, because savanna has to have a four-month dry period to kill things off. And that seems like the problem here. So we've got a climate change, climate variation. OK, but when you actually look at the area fighting between Uganda and Tanzania, killed off all the elephants, the elephants eat the small trees. If you don't have any elephants, you have trees growing. And once they get beyond a certain stage, the elephant doesn't eat them. And so is it a climate problem or is it an elephant problem? And so when you have problems like that that you look at, 
then you go, well, okay, maybe we can't use a lot of these areas to look at what the variation is because we don't have a point specific. And I, I'm going to try to use birds that you know, uh, some cute, some big, some little. Here's our uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, how many people in here have a hummingbird feeder? Excellent, excellent, excellent. That's a problem, by the way, when you're trying to study change caused by climate and weather and other things. These are tiny little birds. And by the way, don't put your feeder away because you think they're going to stay. There's a, a very bad urban legend that if you feed hummers after like the end of August, you kill them because they can't stay. These birds fly across the Gulf of Mexico. It's 1,500 miles. They don't really get to eat other than a few bugs. If, feed them up till the snow if they stay that long. Because when they decide to leave, they'll fly to where it's warm in one or two days, and they don't need to eat. Okay, So that's kind of one of my things. So I feed them as long as we can. Females are larger than males. They're a little bit different. Phenology is what I do. And phenology is where you're looking at how animal life cycle or behaviors change because of changes within your climate. Some can change a great deal. Some have a very limited change. And what we're finding out about birds, non-migrational birds have a very short ability to change. And that is bad for some of the birds. But this is an animal that migrates. And they're actually very cheeky. I've almost been killed by one of these stupid little birds. And when you're climbing, it's very vertical areas. I apparently was close to something. And I had a female actually come up and try to peck me in my eyes while I was 400 feet off vertical. So yeah, they can, they can do very pretty bad things to you. And so there, it, when you look at how climate changes, it's changing all the time, OK? It never doesn't change. Is it a rapid change? Is it too rapid? We've had, if an asteroid hit, which we had 65 million years ago, the change is instantaneous in the record, and it's huge. And so we've had way worse changes than we have today. Now, this is where this little ruber-throated hummingbird lives. It winters down in Central America. And a high percentage of them fly across the Gulf of Mexico. And it's great to be in Key West when they come back, because they all fall out and eat things. We counted 190 of them in five city blocks. It's really cool. But they fly across the Gulf of Mexico. These are tough little guys. But here's what we're seeing as a change. They're coming back earlier. And, you go, and there's no flowers here. But when you think about hummingbirds, you only think about them as eating nectar, when these guys actually eat sap and little bugs as well. And so if any of those are here, and it's probably not because of changes that are going on here. It's warmer climates in where they winter. Now let's see if this works. Yeah, it did. They winter in central, down here in Latin America. And so if that's warmer there, and it is, they seem, they seem to have a clock that they leave earlier. And they're not dying off. Their populations are actually doing quite well. How many people feed hummingbirds again? Makes them really hard to study when humans feed them. <laughs> hmm? Because if you see a hummingbird, I put, I put my feeders out against the articles that went with this. And so I'm expecting them to be there by mid-April. And I have my hummingbird feeders out already. And so I'm exacerbating any scientific study because they come to my feeder. And so anyway, they rely on tree sap. And we've had all kinds of studies now that have shown this is great. Have they changed? Sure. Is it because of the climate? No idea. OK, if so, it's a positive change. I mean, they're not being injured. But there are tens of millions of bird feeders up in the United States, especially hummers. Everybody likes hummingbirds. We only have one species in the east, although calliope hummers are starting to show up a little bit, probably because of the climate change, climate variation that we're seeing. OK, there we go. So how's it going? This year, first sighting I had, now they may have been here earlier because my feeders were out, but my first sighting was May 4th. You should, I'm R. Patrick at Marion.edu. You should put your feeders out in April and text me or type, a, send me an email and tell me when they're at your feeders. I think this is really funny because this is a species that people are relying on to show climate change. 
And it's not a bad change, but I don't think it's climate. I think it's folks. Or get, I don't know, 45 million people to not put out their hummingbird feeders and see what happens. Now, this is just a general thing I put in. I want to show you what, what we know to be true or not true. The Mauna Loa CO2 is really interesting. It passed uh, 400 parts per million on my wife's birthday. So her birthday is like, well, it's actually the 25th, but I counted it as her birthday. I said it was her fault. And so last year, it went above 400 parts. That's the highest it's been in 3 million years. Uh, are humans the cause? I don't look at it that way. There are lots of things that are variables. The sun right now is in a very quiet, it sounds crazy, we've got some high sunspot numbers, but the sunspots are, they tend to be smaller and they're not putting out as much energy and we had almost four years of no sunspots at the last minima. And the, the lag time's about five years. And so it could be that this right here that we're having right now is because five years ago our sun was at a low. But we also know, having I've taught meteorology and climatology to different groups for 32 years on and off, that when you put more energy in a system, it doesn't get warmer. That's not what happens. You have more variation. And so what you have is there are areas where in the Arctic it's very warm, and there are areas where the cold has been pressed south. This is another one of those vortices. We've had it occur before. And this is the hockey stick. Drives me crazy when people look at that. As a math person, the gray is what you look at, because that's your variation. In Indiana, we only have 134 years of weather records. And everybody goes, wow, that's cool. No, if you want to work with weather, we need 1,000 years of good records. We need some monk sitting in the year 700 in France, writing down on April 4th, was it cold, was it hot, was it wet? Because we can do that. I've got a person I know in England who lives in a house that was built in the year 1100, and he works on stuff that the books go back to about, I think it's like six or 700, I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that. But, so he, they, we don't have a real climate record here. And so this is what everybody sees. And what we don't know is I call them signatures. What is it that causes variation within a system? It could be the sun, it could be ocean currents, it could be humans. Now, I think humans have quite a bit to do with it, but I don't have any real units I can put in those set of signatures. And so that's not what I'm here for tonight. You can, you can do almost anything if you understand that there's change and you try to keep up with the change. Now, this is one I really like because it shows you what happens. This was in 2011, and I haven't been able to find the most recent one. This is a period when they're looking at, they're comparing a unit of temperature to like the last eight or 10 years. And look how warm it is. The red is warm and the blue is cold. So we would be going like now, wow, it's cold. And, but yet in Russia and in Alaska, it was 18 degrees above normal that time frame. And so this is what I mean by variation. In other words, yes, it's very warm in places, and we're seeing that at Glacier. And so this is one of those things where the Arctic is warmer. And I, I put this in because of today. Okay, so here we are. This, the left two are last January, the average January 2014. We had a vortex breakout. Look at the temperatures in Alaska. Look at the temperatures here. Now, I couldn't find the same maps because they just haven't made the one yet for the uh, anomaly. But here we are yesterday. There's yesterday's temperature map. And there's the September, the closest one I could find, the departure from average. It's colder, cooler in the Midwest, and it's warmer in the Arctic. So here we are, except it's not January. It's November, OK? This is the variation I'm talking about. And this is what birds have to fight, too. So they have to migrate in and out on this. And I'm having a blast with the studies, because I get to go to cool places. And I like cool. Sorry, I didn't mean that as a pun. I actually like cool. I like cold. There's no bugs, OK? There's no snakes. 